Hey, today we're going to talk about mal de embarkment syndrome, one of the hottest topics on the planet, and motion sickness. He figures out what we're going to talk about each day, so I have to tease him. But it actually is a lot more common than a lot of people think. I don't know if people know that have mal de embarkment syndrome know who to watch this <laughs> because they may not know the term. But uh, but but the motion sickness may bring a lot of people in who really need to hear about this. I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. I am a, uh, a certified functional medicine practitioner. We're both chiropractors. I've been a chiropractor since 1979. Dr. Randall Gates. I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist as well as being a chiropractor. And our main research center here as well. Uh, I do the intakes. I do the consults. I do the initial histories, part of the exam. He does everything else and uh, everything else being treatment, research, things of that nature that have given us the opportunity to develop a chronic condition, in this particular case, chronic condition practice. We've developed a chronic condition and chronic pain practice by squishing the two of our disciplines together. And I think this is a particularly appropriate topic <clears throat> relative to why um, to work with the brain as well as the chemistry of the brain is vitally important. Um, to get some sort of a resolution. We get a lot of patients who come in, who walk into me and say, you know, I don't know what happened, but uh, all of a sudden I can't walk. I, I, I feel like I'm veering to the left or, or, I, or more commonly, I feel like, like I have to put my hands out like on the walls. And, and a lot of times they'll say, I feel like I'm drunk. Um, the history will oftentimes uh, find out that they had previous motion sickness for years and that they were mal de embarking from either a plane or a, that they were, they were on a plane or they were on a ship or, and we were talking about this beforehand, we'll, we'll cover it a little bit more, or maybe they had motion car sickness forever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's like, maybe it's like de embarking from a car. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so we were talking about that because I asked Dr. Gates, is it a fact that these folks always have car sickness? He says, it's not really in the literature yet. However, everybody who comes in here with this syndrome seems to start out with motion sickness. And um, so we're going to talk about all that and the fact that it's highly responsive to different types of treatments that can be available to you um, in, a, in, a, in a much longer maybe um, way as opposed to taking... Um, What's the medication they take all the time for the... Valium is a common one. Yeah, Valium. Baclofen. There's another one. Meclizine. Yeah. Probably what you're yeah. Doing. So anyway, so those uh, those medications, uh, if you're having this problem and they work, that's great. But there might be a better long term alternative than all of those. So um, so mal de embarkment syndrome. I like saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like something. I don't know what. But but let's talk about kind of like the general pattern. There's a certain. I do a talk before Dr. Gates ever got here, so you don't probably want to watch it. <laughs> it's online That's and I talk true. about, no, but it was just a while ago and there's been so much data yes. that we've put together since then on, on our talks. But we talk about the basics of what creates good balance in that. And we talk about the eyes mm -hmm. and the, the ears, which most people think the ears are the whole big deal. And, and frequently, more frequently than not, they're not the primary problem. We talk about the cerebellum. We talk about the parietal lobe and how they all got to mm -hmm. find kind of function together. Um, I'm going to I'm going to defer to Dr. Gates here to do an overview of these two particular conditions and how a couple of those pieces come together um, or maybe fall apart would be a better would be a better uh, uh, a way of putting it. But those four pieces of your brain need to function in sync and coordination for you to have good balance. When one of them starts going, something's going to happen and you're going to experience one of maybe who knows, 18 different patterns of balance, dizziness, vertigo, nausea, those mm -hmm. types of things. Um, and these are essentially two of them, uh, mal de embarkment syndrome and motion sickness, which are uh, related, uh, at least physiologically and structurally. And by the time we're done, you'll know why. So how about an overview of this mm -hmm. topic mm -hmm. or these specific conditions? And I think your emphasis on most patients who have dizziness or vertigo believing that something is wrong with their inner ear is very, very correct because we all know that the inner ear controls balance. So that's where everybody goes first. 
And if you have what we term peripheral vertigo, where if you have something actually wrong with the inner ear, if you have rocks in the inner ear that are, they're technically calcium carbonate crystals, but everybody calls them rocks. If they're in an area of the inner ear where they shouldn't be, if you have a condition called Meniere's disease where the inner ear basically swells, if you have vestibular neuronitis or neuritis where the nerve coming from your inner ear to your brain is inflamed and basically dying, then yes, you're going to have vertigo and your inner ear is the, the issue at hand. But so many conditions causing dizziness and vertigo don't involve the inner ear. The inner ear is part of it, but the inner ear isn't directly involved. Yeah, and, and so, so most really, of the people that come in for the consult are telling me, well, they checked my ear and everything was good. Right, exactly. They even go, you yeah. probably get into this, but they even say, well, I did an MRI, everything was normal. Mm -hmm. They checked right. my, every, you know, so they don't know. This is one of those, we don't know what's wrong with you type of things here. Take the medication and hopefully everything will be okay. And if it's not, you just have to live with it type of thing, exactly. which you don't. Exactly, and that's the impetus for this broadcast. So yeah, so you may go see your ear, nose, and throat specialist, and rightfully so, they have to make sure nothing is wrong with your inner ear. That is step number one. Step number two is, okay, if that's clean, then we need to get an MRI of the brain. Just make sure there's not a tumor or stroke where you have a gentleman right now. Um, we've been treating, he's getting better, but I saw some unusual signs on his uh, examination where we look at the eyes when we're turning the head and we're taking him back and laying him down. And so we got another MRI, and thankfully the MRI was clean. And so he doesn't have a tumor, which I was wondering if he did, but he doesn't. So but now we know before they do the MRI and the ear thing, shouldn't they do a neurological exam? Well, I'll get back to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is a key point. Okay. This, is a, this is a big reason why a lot of people are coming in here going, well, nobody knows what's wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody's doing the exam. They're just going to the MRI and to the, mm -hmm. they're going to the Star system. Wars. They're yep. going to the, the testing yep. and they're not going to the, they're not doing the exam, which told Dr. Gates that they might have needed an MRI. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So and, important point. And then from there, you're saying, well, nothing's wrong with my inner ear. I see the ophthalmologist, nothing's wrong with my eyes. Nothing's wrong with my brain. Why do I still have all these symptoms? And the reason is for many sufferers with dizziness or other forms of vertigo is that there's an issue functionally in the brain. So the brain is not sending the correct signals. The brain may be not interpreting information correctly. So think of a plane. A plane is flying through the air and it has to have sensors to know how fast it's moving. If those sensors don't work, then the engines don't engage and the plane drops out of the sky. Maybe that's a bad example. I mean, I'm not trying to be uh, kind of catastrophic here, but in essence, the same type of computer system works in the brain to compute these visual signals with inner ear signals, with information from the neck, um, to basically orchestrate this, this idea of where you are. So that's the overview that you have to get. It's an ensemble of sensory information from your eyes, your ears, and your neck and your feet to a large degree. And many areas of the brain are involved with that. One of the critical areas that's involved is termed the cerebellum. It is colloquially known as your balance center. And that cerebellum talks to other sensory areas of your brain, namely the parietal lobe. It's a deep part of the parietal lobe. It's called the PIBC, you don't need to know that, but it's a deep area of the parietal lobe that processes all these inner ear signals with the visual ones with the somatosensory. The, the parietal lobe basically, I think, I think the important point on that is, is the parietal lobe senses all of the feedback from all of your, all of yes. the balance mechanisms in, in all of your joints mm -hmm. and muscles. Yeah, and so sensation. So the and then it all comes back to your brain mm -hmm. So a lot of, so you need all, this parietal lobe is a big deal in English. I mean, if you got bad feet, if you got peripheral off in your hands or you got peripheral off your feet, you're not sending proper signals back there. You could have a problem with other, other mm -hmm. parts of the body that are sending back there. So it's a whole balance is a whole body thing. And, and this parietal lobe is kind of what senses the whole body. And then it synchronizes with the mechanisms that you're talking about. And for those of you who, um, who've been watching us for a while, which turns out to be quite a few people at this point. Um, we live in the gut, it seems mm -hmm. like, in mm -hmm. these things, mm -hmm. but we also live in the cerebellum. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so, so you're gonna become a little bit familiar with the little brain today. And, uh, and one of the reasons Dr. Gates picked this uh, topic is because um, I don't know the prevalence of it and he's about to share it with you and I don't know what it is, but I can tell you this, we see this a lot a lot of times people don't even come in with this. A lot of times they have something else. 
and then I'll start getting this feeling like this whole thing is disengaged and not it's synchronized. And I'll just say, you have car sickness? And they'll go like, like why are you asking me that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'll go, you know, do you have car sickness? They'll say, yes. And right away, you know certain parts of the brain are involved, mm-hmm. and Dr. Gates will discuss that with you. So what is the prevalence of this today? I mean, I had car sickness, and you know, mm-hmm. prevalence. I, of- I don't know. I probably had my first concussion when I was two years old, so that's you hard to both. say, yeah. you know. But yeah. I, I know I couldn't go around in a circle when I was a kid, right. uh-huh. and I couldn't do those. When, well, probably a lot of you probably. Well, like the those of you who are sixty-two or older, yeah, those merry-go-rounds mm-hmm. that you would sit on and you would you would spin. Oh my God! Like two times around that, and I was, you know, that's your cerebellum. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so it seemed to me like I wasn't the only one who had that. Exactly. It seemed like there was a lot of people who, who felt that way. It's very, very common in the literature. The way they describe it often is that basically everybody is vulnerable for motion sickness, except if you've had uh, both of your vestibular nerves cut out, <laughs> which can happen in rare situations when people grow tumors in the vestibular nerve, like vestibular schwannomas and nerve fibromatosis and things like that. So that's the nerve that goes to your right. balance mechanism. Right. It goes from your brain to your balance mechanism, even though that's part of your brain. But. Yeah. And there are gradients of severity there, obviously. I mean, you have some people, I mean, they, they drive and they get motion sickness while they're controlling the car. And then there are those who, you know, are reading and talking on their cell phone while riding in the car, you know, on the trip to Hana in Maui, which is a very, you know, curvy road. And they don't have any symptoms. But the literature basically says most people at some point can develop some symptoms. But again, it's a continuum. And motion sickness is very, very common. With mal de embarkment syndrome, it's very, very common in our maritime industry across the world. Right. So basically 80% of people who are out at sea will come back to the shore and they will have persistent feelings for months to years that they're still out at sea and still on the boat, still on the boat. And it can also happen after you're riding on a plane for long periods of time, you, you still feel like you're moving. So mal embarkment syndrome is pretty common in those individuals. And because a lot of people are out at sea you know, on any given day, and a lot of people like to sail and like to go boating, um, we, we have seen this condition actually quite a few times. And we can't say for Even sure. It's considered rare, you know, generally. Right. It's pretty common. It is common. And we can't say for sure that if you have car sickness, that it's going to develop into this. Right. Okay. Yeah. But we can say that pretty much everybody who's ever come in here who ultimately had mal embarkment syndrome had motion sickness before then. But well, it's interesting because then I, again, I mean, if you got eighty percent of the population yeah. who's going to be getting some sort of potential motion sickness, then I don't know. You know, maybe there's a connection. Maybe there's not a connection. Well, I think it's just I think what they is, yeah, there's a connection. What they talk about is it's an unusual sensory <laughs> environment. You know, us human beings were probably meant to just you know walk around. Our brain wasn't really evolved if you want to say it that way, whether you believe in evolution or not, our brain is not necessarily developed to um, anticipate all these different sensory signals of, you know, you're in the, the cabin of the ship and the front of the ship is stable. You know, the wall in front of you is stable, but you're doing this at the meantime. Yeah. You're or you're in a car going you know, like this right. and people are exactly. going that way or, or there's a uh, sign posts or light posts mm-hmm. going like right, that yeah. and your, mm-hmm. your brain's picking it up and that's awfully quick for something that to synchronize right. to. So, yeah. Yeah, we're, I don't think we were made to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> and my experience was I went to Hawaii a few years ago and I, I love to float when I go on vacation. Just a little personal detail for all of you out there who care. Um, so I like to float in the waves. And I had some issues with mal embarkment for about seven days. So technically wow. I didn't have it because I didn't have it for months. But I still felt like I was moving. And I have a history of motion sickness. So, And Dr. Rutherford commented earlier on history. And that's one really, really important thing with any dizziness patient or really any chronic neurological condition. The way the healthcare system has been streamlined, this is not your doctor. This is the healthcare system. This is third-party payers telling your doctors you can spend so much time with the patient. You have to do X, Y, Z. And doctors are getting kind of handcuffed in large part unless they're at specialty centers. Uh, across the country, like Mayo Clinic, Stanford, UCSF, um, to where they have to get in and out. And that is the impetus for a doctor walking in saying, tell me what's wrong. <laughs> you know, some we've heard reports from some patients, you know, doctors saying, well, dizziness is this and vertigo is this. Tell me what's wrong. And they have to be so, so abrupt because they have to get that information quickly to figure out, do they need to order an MRI, so on and so forth. We've kind of set up our clinic outside that system so that we can take the time and take the history because we have had a number of patients um, 
who have been all over the place with different conditions. And it turns out maybe to be anxiety induced dizziness. That was their problem. We had a prominent attorney in town who had that. Whereas others, they actually do have mild in Parkinson's. So you have to go through a detailed history to really figure out, okay, what's causing the dizziness? When did it come on? How long does it last? Or do you have nausea and vomiting associated with it? Does your ear hurt? Does your ear not hurt? Do you have ringing in your ear? Do you have double vision? Is one side of your face or body numb? All those things are really important to, to tease out so that you can actually pinpoint if somebody has mild embarkment or to something like motion sickness or something like anxiety as the cause of their dizziness sensations. And then from there, we do our exam and we get more specific in terms of actually looking at, okay, so nothing's actually wrong with this brain from the MRI perspective, but functionally, what do we see going on that's not normal? We know the brain should be doing this when we turn the head this way, that I should do the opposite. Well, if they're not doing that, then that means something is wrong in that computational model of the brain down there and we need to fix it. And we're gonna to talk to you today about how the new research is showing that malday embarkment syndrome can be fixed. And you and find that out to be the by doing the history that Dr. Gates just said and doing the exam, which is the exam. What Dr. Gates is just saying yeah. is the exam. Yeah. And again, partially due to time, uh, partially due to dictates of forces outside of the doctor's ability in there. There's no incentive, nor is there time to do an exam. And frequently, I think uh, people's exam skills um, deteriorate if, if they don't do an exam. And, and I think after years, it comes down to maybe stand there, close your eyes, you know, touch your fingers to your nose, uh, maybe like the drunk test or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. I'm, I'm pausing because this is potentially contentious matter yeah. because in neurology well, I, think I framed it in I, a realistic way I'm not saying that these people don't know how to right. know anything I mean I know myself if, 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 I'm, if I'm not Dr. Gates does treatment every day and I used to do all the treatment and so when you're in treatment you understand a lot more about the patient you you see their reaction you see their facial expressions you get to understand their how 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 they go through different phases and that helps you to manage the case according to that person and when you're, I mean, I can't only speak for myself. Uh, I, I know the part of the exam I do, I know. Mm -hmm. The part of the exam I used to do, which was your part of the exam. If I, had, and I haven't done it for like three or four years now, but if I had started doing it again, I mean, it'd yeah, take right, me yeah. a couple of months probably mm -hmm. to get back to, to really, really being able to say, oh, that was a nystagmus or that was a saccade or something mm -hmm. like that. This parts of the neuro exam. So I'm not dissing them, I'm just saying, they're, well, they're, 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 what, they're, what, what people have been put into as doctors is, is really not a, a model that allows them to hone their skills. I would agree with that. And I would say, and I'm not meaning to hesitate That's out, of, out of fear, but it's I'm just trying to, you hesitate. to word this correctly. In neurology training, they'll frequently say, you know, the debutante neurologist. So that means the, the new neurologist, the neurologist in residency will do every test under the sun and then they won't necessarily know how to interpret the findings in terms of what's relevant and what's not relative to the case as a whole and it's almost you know i go to neurology conventions with medical neurologists and it's emphasized you know that you want to get your neurological exam brief you want it to be focused you want it to be targeted and while all that's well and good in my experience what i think sometimes happens especially in the dizziness world is that things get targeted so much just to make sure you don't have a tumor or a stroke right that the nuances of some of these more esoteric conditions may not be teased out and that's where the very thorough neurological exam thorough um posturography exam that basically means you know balance testing thorough eye movement exam where you look at how the eyes move because we can glean a an incredible amount of data from how the eyes move turning the head eyes moving left following objects red and white stripes moving past the eyes tells us what's going on with the brain. I think it's then, very well put. And then from that, we can, I think that's why we've been able to give patients answers, you know, who have been everywhere as to why they're still having symptoms. Yeah. So and for those of you who haven't everywhere. ever watched this before, if you go back and watch any of our stuff, I think we've had to say this or have said this every time. We are so not anti-medicine. Yeah, we have a lot of respect for the abilities of anybody who can get through medical school and become mm -hmm. a neurologist. We're just saying that the framework of, of, of the model that's developed, Clearly, the framework of the model that's developed is not a great framework for chronic pain or chronic conditions, or we wouldn't have 120 million chronic pain patients running around this country, according to Stanford, according to Harvard, according to the World Health Organization. I mean, those are numbers that used to be 50 million when I got into it, and now we're 120 million. It's just that that's 
it's a poor model for evaluation and treatment of these types of conditions. It's more for what you said, mm -hmm. pathology. I think it's just yeah. important for right. people to know I agree. that. I agree. So that they, people always come in and say, well, why does my doctor know this? And I say, your doctor does probably know this. I said, but it's, it's not really within the framework of what they're really looking for, which is tumors, pathologies, yeah, exactly. neuromas, things of that nature. And you know, I'll just follow up on that. I mean, I wrote two letters yesterday to a, a neurologist here in town saying, here's what's going on with this patient. Can you please look at this? Because it was more in his model than it was in our model yes. to take care of and, that. Yeah, we issue. absolutely refer. After you yeah. do the exam, after you do, yeah, of course, we, we say, okay, this is what's going say, on. Hey, this is not for us. Yeah. This is for this is for that model, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, do you feel like you've covered, or do you want to cover further, kind of the how how the brain gets a frame of reference? For, I think we got that. You think I we think got that? So, um, where do you want to go next? Do you want to go with? The, yeah, let's go with, with how the, the vestibular studies, system it? works. Okay. So the vestibular system is really interesting. That's your inner ear. Okay, so I'm going to say vestibular system from now on. Inner ear balance mechanism, because it has to it has to sense rotation. I'm going to say something because it's something sure. that people ask okay. all the okay. time. Good. They'll say, "I'm deaf. Does it have anything to do with it? I can't hear." Does it may or may not. Okay. I just want <laughs> exactly. to. Exactly. People ask uh -huh. me that yeah. almost every time. Okay. Yeah. I'm with so you. vestibular is different than the, than the hearing part of the same nerve. So yeah. sometimes they're both involved. Sometimes they're independently involved. Okay. So the vestibular system senses rotation of the head uh, or really the body. It senses rotation or translation of the body as well. So, you know, you're going up in the elevator and you feel like your stomach drops out. That's your vestibular system saying, hey, we're going up. So the vestibular system has the, the acute role of moving the eyes opposite the direction of the head. So if you're suddenly turned to the right hand side, your eyes will actually go to the left so that your eyes can remain stable on what's going on. The reason why this is probably developed is because if you're running, you don't want your eyes bobbling all over the place in conjunction with your head. So you don't want your eyes doing this while you're running because then you wouldn't be able to see where you're running. And there are great accounts of, uh, in fact, doctors who've had inner ear or vestibular nerve lesions who then realize how, how disabling this is because lots of times they can't control their eyes when they're walking. So everything will just be blurry and out of focus. And it's, a, it's an example of how important the vestibular system is in daily life. So the vestibular system does exactly as I said, it moves the eyes opposite the direction of the head. And that's a very, very quick reflex, 13 milliseconds for that to occur. And the way it happens is that in our inner ear, let's just say we're turning the head, we have a little, Think of a pipe. We have three pipes, but these pipes have a little sail in them. So when you move your head, fluid in the pipe moves and the little sail moves saying, okay, the head is going to the right, move the eyes to the left. Well, that response will only last for a certain number of seconds. It depends on the resource, but some people say like six seconds. But then the response in the brainstem will last for 15 seconds. So the inner ear receptor will only produce a signal for six seconds, but your brainstem can keep that six second signal going for 15 seconds. Does that make sense? Should that's, I say it one more that's time? That's becoming a little bit, or at least for me. <laughs> let me bring it down. <laughs> okay, let me take it down another one. And I kind of know what he's talking about. <laughs> I'm thinking like... This is the area I work on the most. You got to yes. know. This is his bring world, it down. let me tell you. Bring it down. In essence, just know that the inner ear signals are perpetuated in the brainstem. Is that a fair way of saying Okay, it? and the brainstem is, again, we go back to whether you're, we believe that God created evolution, I think, for our patients. <laughs> so we don't get any trouble. But the brainstem is considered the old brain. The brainstem is the, it, it, so it's, it's your brainstem. This thing that comes out of your brain and then it becomes your spinal cord. And it, it controls most of your automatic stuff, your breathing, your heartbeat, all that type of stuff. And it has, and these nerves, but these nerves come off your brain stem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so exactly. that's kind of a different part of your brain than all of the, all the invaginations that you see as your brain. So you have this brain stem, you have this brain, the nerves come off of here and they go out in this particular case to that part of your ear that creates the balance. So that perpetuation of inner ear signals is really the main problem with malady embarkment syndrome. And it can also be an issue with motion sickness patients it's because the perpetuation becomes amplified. So rather than the inner ear signal being perpetuated for let's say 15 seconds, now it gets amplified for 20, 25 seconds. And it can be 
not the same on the right side versus the left side. And this is the really cool thing they're finding with Mal the embarkment syndrome because they take monkeys, they took monkeys, that's how they figured this out. And they had them rotating like this in the darkness and they looked at their eyes before they did this and then they did it after. And then after they did it, they saw that their eyes were not moving in the normal fashion that it should even after like two hours. And then they've gone back and looked at mal -day embarkment syndrome patients and seen the exact same finding. So with mal -day embarkment syndrome, it's a problem of how your brain is computing the inner ear information. So it isn't that your brain is used to being on the boat or on in the in the car or on the airplane and it has to reach a certain threshold to be able to deal with that and then maybe it's unable to deal with that and then afterwards it's not your brain just doesn't shut it back down well you can are and that's a wonderful point which is so, how i understood it right. that's why i'm asking right <laughs> that, that was the old model okay and this is kind of okay. like the new model well, coupled the old with guy. the old model okay. coupled with the old model so Again, the inner ear signals are perpetuating the brainstem abnormally in a malady embarkment syndrome. One way to look at that is that the brain is not shutting off that perpetuation of inner ear signals. That's one problem. The other problem becomes that the frontal lobe, specifically in an area of your frontal lobe that develops first, or if you want to say evolutionarily, um, it's seen in lower mammals and vertebrates. And this area of the frontal lobe ties in with the memory center. So what they find with mal and Barkman syndrome patients is not only the perpetuation of the inner ear signals, but then this enhanced memory of the inner ear signals. Which okay, is so it back, learns. So it learns. It. learns. So you come off the boat and it's there and, it's a, and, it, and, it, and in some ways it doesn't shut off. But in other ways, he's saying that your the frontal lobe is where you do your learning. I don't know if it's that mm -hmm. connection or not but that frontal lobe actually learns the mechanism. So, so now you got two mechanisms going, mm -hmm. or you know, one yeah. or other right. or both. Uh, okay, so, so that, and the, both of those can be changed. Both right. of those can be changed. Um, so yes, yeah, so okay, can. okay. So if I understand that now, hopefully you understand that. <laughs> okay. Should I say it one more time? No, I think, that, okay, I, think that's, okay, I think that's good. Okay, great. So from there, they've started saying, okay, well, what can we do in a research setting to help these people? And one of the things that Dr. Rutherford and I were talking about is something called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or RTMS. We talk about that all the time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is where they put a big magnet over the frontal lobe and specifically the attention area of the frontal lobe. And they can put, they can basically cause your frontal lobe to increase its activity, which is what we do and we'll explain through exercise. But they increase the frontal lobe's activity and they notice that a lot of mal embarkment syndrome patients started getting better. Mm -hmm. And it's probably because they're unlearning these perpetuated inner ear signals because their frontal lobes are working so well, they can shut off this old part of the frontal lobe that was involved in the learning it's working process. so well because they're stimulating it with the magnets. They're stimulating with the magnets. Right. The other really cool thing that they're doing or that they've shown with uh, mal embarkment syndrome patients is having them, they're figuring out, okay, so it looks like their brain is not processing these signals. So rolling back side to side, that's how it's termed properly. So one side gets kind of dominant, one side gets kind of weak. And so they have them look at their thumb while it's like the world is spinning around them. So they have it uh, they call it a full field visual stimulus. So you can like paint little uh, cactuses and palm trees on this canvas, and then you circulate it around this individual. So it looks like the world is spinning around them while they look at their thumb. And, and, that, and that unprograms the perpetuation of the inner ear signals. And the reason we talk about this is because again, I do the observations and I said to Dr. Gates, we had the conversation, I said, these things don't seem to work for a long term. I think they seem to do like 10 or 12 or 14 treatments or something like that. And then, and then there's a short term uh, positive response. I'm only talking from the experience of the patients who've come in here and have had this done. So I haven't seen a thousand people who've done this, but enough to, to see a consistency of that. And, and, and I stated to him, is it because it's, it's a general stimulation as opposed to the, the exercises that Dr. Gates uses and that have been developed in the functional medicine neurology field are much more specific and or is it that the other things that are chemically setting them up to have this perpetuate and not shut down 
are the problem? And I think your answer was both. Right. And so and I don't know those early studies, I do, moment, because but... now they're doing follow-up studies where they're doing these types of stimulations for about a year. So right. patients are going in for a long period of time, probably longer than ever would be applicable in today's study. healthcare because, you know, insurance companies are going to cut you down at 12 visits or 14 visits. Right. So they're doing these therapies now for a year to try and create more learning in the brain, positive learning to get rid of these abnormal perpetuated inner ear signals. And I absolutely agree. In our experience, sorry for hitting the mic, but in our experience, it's just absolutely imperative to assess someone from a metabolic perspective who has dizziness. That means you have to assess them for diabetes. You have to assess them for autoimmune disease. You have to assess them for gluten intolerances. You have to assess them for inflammation in the system because all those things, you have to see if they smoke because all those things can cause the cerebellum and other areas of the brainstem not to work as well as they could. And if they're at a metabolic disadvantage, like you're going to the gym, but you're not eating and you drink, you're probably not going to build muscle as well as you could. And in that same example, you're probably not going to build your cerebellum as well as it could be. And for those of you who interrupt me during the consult while I'm saying that and say, well, why do I have to do all that? If it's just my brain, why don't I just do the exercises? Uh, I, I, and I say the cerebellum is so sensitive. They use it for the drunk test. Period. <laughs> okay. They analogy. use it for the drunk test. You have one. Uh, and, it, and believe me, those alcohol levels aren't very high today. It doesn't take much to not be able to pass the drunk test. Why? Because your cerebellum is so sensitive to just an ounce or less of alcohol that you can't walk a straight line. You can't close your eyes and stand like this. You can't touch your nose. You can't do those things. And if it's sensitive to that, let me tell you, it's sensitive to blood sugar abnormalities. It's sensitive to inflammation. It's sensitive to a lack of oxygen. It's sensitive to gluten sensitivities. It's sensitive to everything. I mean, I know. <laughs> I have a sensitive cerebellum. And I mean, I'm telling you, you wouldn't want to follow my diet. But that's, but that's, I hope that maybe brings that into a little bit more perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you have a bad cerebellum and you do get stuff for the drunk test, just tell them, give me a breathalyzer because I can't pass it. <laughs> so. And I frequently tell patients, I have this documented, don't worry. Yeah. If you get pulled over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, um, that's the current data on mild embarkment syndrome relative to motion sickness. They discuss it as a visual vestibular mismatch. That's the main uh, terminology that's used. There are other complexities there before your eyes glaze over. What that means is it kind of as I illustrated before, let's say you're riding in the plane. You're, you're in the plane and you're at the front of the cabin and the wall in front of you is perfectly stationary, but the plane is going through turbulence. So the plane is going up, the plane is going down. The plane is rolling side to side. And when your vestibular system is saying, holy cow, we've never felt this before, this is crazy. And your visual system is saying everything is perfectly still. And all those signals are computed in your cerebellum. And one of the thoughts are that you get this excessive burst of information from the inner ear, the visual system is saying something different, the cerebellum basically, uh, what do you say when the computer crashes? The computer crashes, the cerebellum kind of crashes and all that inner ear information going into the cerebellum allows more information to come out of the cerebellum and go to the area of your brainstem that makes you nauseous, that drops your blood pressure, that start, causes you to start sighing, that causes you to, um, to start sweating. And next thing you know, you're reaching for the bag. And so that is motion sickness in a nutshell. But it's a very similar process to mild embarkment syndrome because you are basically in a plane or you're in a car or you're in a boat and you're not feeling so good because you're getting this abnormal motion that you're probably just not used to most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you fix it? That's my, that's the next point. The I mean, next, I can tell them how you fix right. it, brought, but you know, so, basically in general so, so or specifically, specifically <laughs> I go back to that exam we talked about in terms of really looking at someone's balance. It's more than just having them stand with their feet together. We put them on foam pads. I have them turn their head in every different direction so we can see how they sway because you have to look at how the inner ear is lining up when somebody's head is turned and how the cerebellum is processing that because they're experiencing that in daily life. They're walking down the street. Somebody says, hey, Joe, how you doing? And they lose their balance. Well, that's important. So we look at that. We also look at how the eyes move with a great degree of acuity because as we've said in other broadcasts, the way the eyes move, is really one of the most well-researched aspects of brain function. We know an incredible amount based on watching a patient's eyes, likely what's happening in their brain from thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of studies. 
And by doing that, we can actually pinpoint and say, oh, well, rather than just saying you have a cerebellar problem, we can actually say this little, little nucleus in the middle part of your right cerebellum, that's your issue. That's what's not working right. Nucleus is just an accumulation of nerve cells. Or maybe it's this top surface of the middle part of your cerebellum. That's not working right. And that's why you have this perpetuation of inner ear cells. Or no, it's this other area called the paraflocculus, which is right at the bottom of the cerebellum. You can tell I'm so excited because this is what I love. But maybe it's that area that's involved to a greater degree. So you have to go in and then rehab that area and see how the person responds. And this is the difference between, to me, the magnetic therapy right. and the specific, we did something last week or a week before yeah. on functional neurology, mm -hmm. and the specific exercises that have been developed in functional neurology because the magnetic therapy is, is pretty general. Whereas when you have all these different areas of the, of the cerebellum, if you can go in there and specifically strengthen that area with a an air with an exercise that is specific to that area, you're going to get a much quicker result. You're going to get a much more powerful result. You can look up our our talk on neuroplasticity. You're going to get much more neuroplasticity in the short term and thus in the long term. And you're going to have a and you're going to have a much finer tool to use eventually, as I have. I keep doing this because that's one of my exercises. Mm -hmm. As I have to maintain my function of, of the cerebellum. Uh, even if I feel like I'm waning during the day, I can, do a, I can do literally 30 seconds of an exercise that is very targeted for my specific cerebellum, maybe, maybe a minute, and I'm like, I am right back where I should be. So, mm -hmm. so you didn't talk about the exercises specifically, but there are exercises, there are stimulations. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the brain needs in addition to not needing inflammation and needing proper blood sugar and needing enough oxygen is stimulation. It needs proper stimulation. If that area is not working, it's not getting the proper stimulation. It's shut down and um, it's deafferentating. Uh, uh, watch another one of our videos <laughs> to see that. And, uh, and so these exercises can go in there and just like strengthening your bicep with a, with a barbell, these exercises can strengthen that specific area. And there are different exercises for different areas of the cerebellum. Yeah. And I would also just go on to say, you really need to watch last week's broadcast on functional neurology to kind of get what we're talking about. Because it, it would be so important if you have maladie and Barker yeah. syndrome or motion sickness. Yeah. It's just That's basically what we would do. Yeah, and sometimes stimulating the involved area may not be the best thing. Sometimes you have to go to another part of the brain that talks to that involved area to just start getting it to work much slower. So, you know, let's say you, uh, you tore your bicep and rather than doing bicep curls, you want to do some wrist curls because you want to kind of activate yeah. the bicep, but not directly. So that's what we're doing. And uh, we found it to be very successful. So now while we do that, basically while, while the exercises are occurring, then we, we have a very extensive history on the patient. And that history comes from, oh my God, I don't even know how many patients, but that history has been put together in order to tease out what metabolic issues might be attacking that cerebellum. And in our world, for neurological patients and autoimmune patients. That seems to be our whole practice. Even though people don't come in here with thinking they have autoimmune problems or neurological problems, mm -hmm. it ends up if they have chronic pain or chronic conditions, they usually have one of those two things. And then that tells us what areas might be, do they have high blood sugar? Do they have low blood sugar? Do they have prediabetes, but nobody's paying attention to it because it's not a big deal, except if you have prediabetes and you have a cerebellar problem, the cerebellum that they use for the drunk test because only a little bit of alcohol makes it not work right. If you have a blood sugar problem, you have a bad gut problem, you have something like that, let me tell you, you will get inconsistent results. Those people who did the magnetic stuff and probably got inconsistent or no results, they probably had a bad, bad physiology. Maybe they had diabetes, maybe they had a leaky gut, maybe they had food sensitivities. In that world, frankly, they don't really pay a lot of attention to no. that. That's the other thing, okay? So, so that's the full thing. Well, and there's, there's even a balance between, is it that the cerebellum or the frontal lobes, particularly cerebellum, are so weak because I've had concussions, okay? But I also have celiac. Is it, is it because of the damage to it that it needs the, the exercises? Or is it because they have so much sensitivity to the inflammation out of this kind of my world, this functional medicine guy? that we've had people who've gotten off of their food sensitivities and had an immediately dramatic response, or is it both? And usually it's both. 
but the question is how much of each, right. each one is right. it? So from that perspective, it's a little bit of a sophisticated uh, uh, flow to figure it out, but it's all about figuring it out. And the, those of you who might have thought I was obnoxious, <laughs> trying to point to the fact that nobody was doing exams, the way you find that out is you do a history and exam, a little bit of treatment, and then you can understand which is what. Why is that important? So when the patient is done with the initial care to get that under control, then you can give them the tools that they need to know about, whether it's diet, whether it's food sensitivities, whether it's exercises, to maintain them. That's the only way I know of as to how to correct these and get them corrected long-term. I don't really know of any other way. All the other ways are effective, but they're effective in the short term. They're effective sporadically because they're not, because most of these therapies are not taking into account the, um, the metabolic environment of the brain, particularly in this particular case, the, the cerebellum. And again, unless it sounds like a good book title, the <laughs> metabolic environment of the brain. There you go. And, and again, just to re, just to kind of reiterate, we, you know, we talked a lot about the frontal lobe, the vestibular the frontal lobe, and then we threw a cerebellum in there, kind of like cerebellum. The, the reason cerebellum is important because it synchronizes everything in your brain. So if that's off, other things suddenly have to kind of make up for that imbalance be between these mechanisms in this case that are causing the imbalance. And so if, so if that's off, that's going to affect the other thing. If the other things are off, that's going to affect it. It'll shut down stimulation to it. So, but the cerebellum is really the center of your brain universe. And if, mm -hmm. and if that's gone, you have problems. And you may not know that's what it is, but you have problems. And, and that's kind of, um, that's a very, very important point. Yeah, I would agree. I think I for agree. me, it's an Absolutely. important point. So we attached a number of articles to today's broadcast. If you want to go through them, if you have a scientific background, we have all, all groups watching these videos. We have patients, we have mothers, we have doctors, we have um, PhDs who are watching. So we have the articles attached and I think we pretty well covered. I think we've we hit all to. levels. Yes, yeah. hopefully. And if you, um, we don't say if you have any questions anymore, because we can't do that. But for more information, uh, because we had too many questions, we just, we could not handle the, the volume of emails. But if you have more, uh, if you are looking for more information, go to powerhealthtalk.com or go to our Facebook page and uh, you can find information about our clinic or whatever else you're looking for. And uh, thank you for watching. Yes, thank yeah. you. See you next week.